Hey folks, Yusef Musavi here, and today we're going to dissect a cue from a video game I'm scoring called Cursed Voyage. Specifically, we're going to take a detailed look at the role Ventus Tin Whistle plays as the melodic centerpiece of the arrangement. We'll start by looking at the melody from a more compositional perspective, and then we'll move on to looking at the instrument itself and the ways I leveraged its various tools to really make it come alive, which, spoiler alert, is pretty easy. So let's take a listen to what we're working with here. Okay, so let's start with a bit of context. This composition is the game's main theme and played over the title screen. As this game is heavily inspired by JRPGs from the 90s, I took a more cinematic and long-form narrative approach with a strong melody at the helm. Sonically, the general idea here is to balance the sounds of fantasy-based games with the energy of a guitar-driven band. Now, the form of this arrangement is simple enough. Intro, A, A, B. And today we'll just be focusing on the melody of the A sections. Speaking of form, let's look at the form of the phrases of the A melody. This melody consists of four distinctive phrases. Let's name them A1, A2, B, and C. You might have noticed that phrases A1 and A2 have only slight differences among them. We're employing some motivic development here by giving both phrases almost the same rhythm, but then making the notes at the end different. While this isn't always done consciously, it's a time-proven technique to ensure a more memorable and catchy melody. The same idea continues on a smaller scale both with phrases B and C. B's melody is almost entirely composed of the same rhythms, as is C's. Another interesting element of this melody is its contour. Looking at the melody from a different perspective now, if we trace the path of the notes, connect the dots style, we can see the journey the melody takes through this section. This melody moves in waves, up and down, gradually getting higher. It reaches its apex three quarters of the way through and then promptly begins to fall back down. Now, from a more traditional perspective, a melodic contour such as this is considered yet another trick for making pleasing sounding melodies. In terms of scales, this section is in E minor with brief moments of mode mixture borrowing from E Dorian. So, you know, it's the classic interplay between parallel minor and parallel Dorian. It's a very common melodic and harmonic tool employed by composers channeling Celtic or fantasy-esque settings. But of course, if you're really trying to channel those vibes, you'd be hard pressed to find a method more immediate than using a tin whistle. Which leads us to the instrument itself. Let's open up Contact, take a look at the UI, and some of the functions I'm employing. For this track, I'm using the Agile Legato patch, because I wanted a faster sounding legato. Now, for me, the hallmark of any well-designed instrument is its open and play nature. And bells and whistles aside, you can just open up this instrument, turn up the dynamics and vibrato, and just start playing. And 
And that's basically how I began recording the MIDI data for this track. I just turned up the dynamics in vibrato, played the melody live, quantized it, and that gave me this. So I've got to say, it sounds absolutely fine as is. The recorded samples performed by uh, woodwind guru Josh Plotner, seriously, he plays them all, um, are really musical in and of themselves. Now, while this sounds very good raw by taking advantage of dynamics, vibrato, and articulations, we can really make this melody sing. So let's talk a bit more about how he did that, uh, starting with dynamics. With the dynamics fader, located here, we're able to get a more musical performance with our melody, and we can better interact with the arrangement's dynamics. If you right-click it, you'll see it defaults to MIDI CC1. Now, I have an outboard fader already set to CC1, but of course, you can ride the dynamics fader however you like. I recorded this melody by riding the dynamics using my outboard fader, and then touching it up using my right tool for added precision. Let's take a quick listen to what this sounds like now that I've added and edited the dynamics to my liking. The next step I took was adding in vibrato. Vibrato in the Ventus series, much like instruments in real life, has a significant effect on the dynamics of the instrument. So as you increase vibrato intensity, the volume of the whistle gets louder. Uh, this adds another level of depth and realism to the instrument that I think is really nice. But because of this, you may find it more intuitive to record vibrato before dynamics. If we click on the drop-down menu here, we see there's three different types of vibrato. In this recording, I'm using breath, a style of vibrato done with the mouth by manipulating the airstream for its smooth sound. I'm using the default CC, which is 11. One thing you'll probably want to keep in mind is that some of the articulations will trigger only at lower vibrato CCs, so remember to dip down at the appropriate times. Which leads us to my final step in the melody sequencing. Let's head over to the Articulations tab, and right off the bat, look at all those articulations. That is what we like to see. Now there's tons of potential customization here, and if you want to do a deep dive into all of the functionality of this specific UI called Tact, I highly recommend checking out Andrew's awesome video on it, linked in the description. But to summarize what I've done, legato transitions and portamento are set to trigger via specific velocities. Everything else is set to trigger via key switches, and if you look on the keyboard at the keys highlighted in yellow, I've organized those key switches to my liking. So let's begin adding in these articulations. And even though they aren't articulations, I'm including breath samples here because, just like key switches, they're additive elements of the performance I need to write directly into the piano roll. In regards to sequencing, it's quite common, even among professionals, to neglect simple aspects of an instrument's limitations. Uh, I do it all the time. You know, sometimes I do it intentionally because I like the way it sounds, other times I do it completely out of ignorance. But for this track, I made sure to include rests at the appropriate intervals during the quantization stage to simulate where a tin whistler might breathe. In contact, breaths are the notes highlighted in cyan on the keyboard. Something you might find useful uh, is creating a separate instance of Ventus, as I have, uh, so you have better control over the volume of the breaths. Let's take a listen to the A section without the breaths and then with the breaths added in. I'll turn the breaths up a bit so they're really noticeable.
moving on to the other articulations, here, here, and here in purplish blue are portamento. Portamentos. Is, is portamento plural? Portamen, portamenti. Portamenti. Portamen, portamenti. If you remember, I'd set portamento to be velocities 1 to 29. Portamento is engaged by overlapping two notes, as you can see here. Next, we have the legato articulations, which are engaged in the exact same way with velocities 30 to 127. Now, this track doesn't feature a ton of legato, as I wanted the passages to be very clear and defined. That said, I added in legato to a handful of locations simply to randomize the playing style of the performance, much like an actual player does. Next, we have a few sus bend ups. These are done by sliding up to a target note from a random lower note. I use this for an especially dramatic effect at the end of the second A, as we'll hear in a moment. Lastly, we have some more ornamental style articulations here, 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 and here. We have a cut, a cran roll, and a few sus trills, all of which are incredibly idiomatic of the tin whistle style. Let's take a listen to the track now that all of our articulations are in place. I especially like how the portamento sounds. You can get some really lifelike behind the beat performances there. Lastly, let's take a very quick look at how I'm mixing the tin whistle, and I'll disengage all of the current plugins. The original dry samples are incredibly transparent and even include very clearly the breath of the player. A blank canvas like this is ideal because it gives us a lot to play with. You'll notice the player's air gets louder as we increase vibrato. This is super realistic and intimate sounding, but I personally don't think it's the vibe for this recording. To remedy this, the first step in my mixing chain is fab filter. You'll notice a rather dramatic high-pass filter in the high 300s. Everything below that is breath sound and it's being attenuated significantly. Let's listen to that bypass and then engaged. Yeah, I think that's cleaning up the signal rather nicely. Next in the chain is a compressor. This is just the stock Cubase compressor, and I'm using it specifically because it's incredibly transparent. I just want compression and none of the flavor that comes with emulated hardware. I started with a vocal preset and then altered the threshold and ratio so that it's just doing some light peak reduction. Now, if we go back and take a look at FabFilter's visualizer, we can see the tin whistle has a very pure timbre. Both the fundamental and overtones are incredibly defined. With instruments like these, I find additive EQ sometimes causes weird resonances, but then that subtractive EQ sometimes makes certain notes too quiet. So instead, I'm using Soothe 2, which is a dynamic resonance suppressor to help clean up the signal. Let's engage the delta knob and listen to what it's taking away. <laughs> Lastly, I'm employing two reverbs. Because of this instrument's dry nature, it really loves to be paired with a good reverb. The first is the reverb rack unit under the effects tab. 
I'm using the default reverb Chamber Hall 1, and all I've done is increased the wet knob and upped the high pass filter to around 150 Hz, just to prevent some of the low end air from being sent to the reverb. Then, I'm adding in a bit of reverb from East West's Spaces plugin as a send. And just like the first reverb, I've also got the filter engaged with a bit of a high pass. Let's listen to what the whistle sounds like dry, then with the first reverb, and then the second reverb engaged. And that's basically it, folks. We'll take a listen to the track, the completed track, and now that we have some sense of how we got here. But before we do, if you are interested in the Ventus series, head over to Impact Soundworks website for more details. A very special thank you to Sprite Knights, the video games developer, for giving us permission to use the track in this video. Links to all of the related social media can be found in the description below. Once again, my name is Yusef Musavi, and thanks so much for watching. See you next time.